Bloomberg Technology, I'm Emily Chang. All this week, Bloomberg Television and Radio are on the ground in Boston, showcasing tech giants and startups, plus breakthrough technologies in the fields of biotech and robotics. We're speaking with innovators, venture capitalists, and government officials who've all laid roots across the city. Our Caroline High joins us now from outside the Museum of Science in Boston, overlooking the Charles River. And Caroline, I see uh, spring hasn't quite yet sprung in Boston. You are all bundled up. <laughs> You're so right, Emily. I mean, it's a touch chilly here, but beautiful nonetheless. I'm going to see the bright side. And indeed, the sun just breaks out for us. A special edition, though, of Bloomberg Technology for you. Welcome from the ever popular Museum of Science, which welcomes about one and a half million visitors a year. Me included today. I had way too much fun, Emily, playing on the musical stairs. But I digress because today we're going to take a look at the Massachusetts biotech sector, which benefits from funding from both local venture capitalists and federal research centers like the National Institute of Health. Meantime, while well, the Trump administration has proposed cuts that could hamper future growth and many local companies are opposing some of the president's other initiatives, such as the Affordable Health Care Act and the tightening of H-1B visa restrictions. For a look at how some local companies are responding, we're joined now by Bloomberg biotech reporter Johnny Bloomfield and John Auerbach, his partner at CRV, which has invested in more than 400 startups, including local success stories such as PillPack. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Johnny, first of all, paint the picture for us. We keep talking about Boston as the biotech hub, the beating heart of it. Which company should be on our agenda here? What trends should we be looking at? Well, I think that some of the central companies here, of course, are Biogen, Vertex, Alnylam. Some of the largest uh, companies in biotech are based here. And of course, so many little tiny companies spring up all around them and around the universities around here. Um, but I think that some of the trends that we should be looking at are some of the move towards rare diseases. I think that We've talked so much about pricing in this industry, and there's been so much pressure on pricing, but some of the folks that have been resistant to that trend are those that focus on rare diseases because insurers and payers are a lot less willing to fight back against very high prices. So for example, Vertex treats cystic fibrosis. They have a couple of drugs there and they're working on more. And for those, they charge hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Biogen also just come out with a new drug called Spinraza for a deadly muscle disease. And the first year of treatment on that costs about $750,000. And wow. so these are areas that um, local companies are really pushing into and across the, uh, the country as well. And when you're obviously helping cure such crucial areas as rare diseases, John, there's also plenty of money that needs to go into funding these sorts of long-term bets. How much of the ecosystem you've been looking at, how much does it continue to grow from your mind's eye from a VC? It's a great question. The ecosystem is booming. Why is it? Because Boston is the absolute epicenter of biotechnology. Every major pharma company has R&D centers here. And there's one reason, it's the education. We've got 50 colleges in the Boston area, 200,000 students come here. We convince them to move from around the world to a place with great weather. <laughs> and they stay and they join pharma companies. And that makes an incredibly fertile ground for funding of these companies. Fertile ground for funding, but maybe not funding from the government at the moment. I mean, Donnie, talk to us about some of the concerns that have come in. NIH seems to have kept the money flowing for the short term. The, the short term budget seems to have kept the, the coffers going. But there is worry about the Affordable Care Act changes. There is worried about the Trump administration and their viewpoint on, on health care in general. Yeah, I mean, a lot of local companies had major concerns around some of the Trump immigration orders, of course, which have been saved by the courts, uh, because attracting people means attracting people from all over the world. And if there are problems because of religion or because of which country you're coming from, mm -hmm. you know, that's going to be an issue potentially for some of the innovation around this area. And that's certainly what a lot of the companies have said. Um, when it comes to pricing, I think some of the concern around the changes to to Obamacare um, in this act that uh, just passed the House still needs to go through the Senate. Um, in that case, there are some concerns that we could get lifetime limits back. These are limits on how much insurers can are will pay uh, for a patient's care. And when you're talking about a drug which could potentially cost three hundred and fifty thousand dollars more a year. That adds up very quickly. And so I think that's a major concern for some of the companies that are moving into these rare diseases, because if those lifetime limits are back, 
then they're going to be facing some major struggles when people hit their caps. John, when you have a long-term perspective on as a VC, of course, these are not overnight success stories. How much can you factor in the day-to-day -day swings of the pendulum that come up with politics? They're actually important because no city feels health care funding from the government like Boston. The top four NIH-funded hospitals in the country are all in Boston. But this could be a good thing because when the funding dries up, if it does dry up, it means these people who are entrepreneurs and do want to start companies will think about private funding and we're there to fill that gap. How much are we seeing the VC community expand here in, in, in Boston? Because, I mean, many feel that Silicon Valley is just so much of a bigger brother. Are you seeing just big VCs come over from there or is there a real building up of money to sell support this particular system. In traditional technology, Silicon Valley, where we also have offices, is of course the big brother. It might be actually the grandfather in many ways. However, in biotech, this is the center of excellence. You see venture capitalists from the Bay Area swarming here from around the country. It's because we've got the three ingredients. We've got first the universities, which draw the students here. We've got big pharma, which, pharma, which builds up clusters of entrepreneurial excellence. And you've got radically decreasing price is costs of building a company in this space, which means that if you're a young researcher at one of these companies and you've got an idea, it doesn't require $50 million to see whether it works. Maybe you can do it for five. Don, are you seeing international money coming in? Yeah, there definitely is international money here. And I think that one of maybe the best examples of that clustering is that, for example, CRISPR, which is this you know gene editing technology, you know, all three of the big gene, uh, the, the three big CRISPR companies all have their R&D centers right across over there in Cambridge. And that's because you have that clustering effect going on. And John, lastly, I, therefore, when you're looking at how the investments you continue to make, where are you looking to in terms of exits as well? Are we seeing money getting refueled back into the system? Are angels exiting? Are we seeing M&A? Are we seeing IPOs? The IPO markets have been muted at best, but we're seeing uh, an opening of a window. Mm -hmm. In biotech, they've actually been wide open, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why you have traditional technology venture capitalists moving into biotech. But it's more important than that. It used to be silos where you had healthcare on one side and technology on another, and now with the powers of machine learning and artificial intelligence, you're starting to see the converging of those two spaces. And of course, you're in PillPack, you're in a number of companies, I mean, what is it, 400 stars? startups at least and you've exited half of them. Which companies of your portfolio should we look at, biotech or non-biotech? I think broadly PillPack is one that you've focused a lot on. They're really making fundamental changes to the way prescription drugs are delivered. You've got a company in the healthcare space out in the Bay Area called Amino, which is changing people's access to doctor's reports and booking, using again the power of big data. I think the resounding theme here is the convergence of traditional technology with healthcare is incredibly exciting. Guys, it's been great having you sat here, welcoming the cold. You got your puffer on, I've liked it. Donna, you've just managed just smooth it on out. I'm liking your style. Thank you very much indeed, guys. It's been great. Bloomberg Biotech reporter Johnny Bloomfield, who takes on the cold, and CRV partner John Alcoback. Thank you very much indeed. Now, more on Boston shortly, but let's take a quick look at one of today's top tech headlines for you. Now, Amazon just unveiled the Echo Show, which has voice-activated speakers and a 7-inch touchscreen. Bloomberg first reported this news device last November. Users can pull up calendar appointments, display music lyrics, and play videos. It's also the first Echo speaker with a built-in camera that makes video conferencing possible. The Echo Show will be available late next month and will be the fifth product powered by the Alexa Digital Assistant. Now coming up, more of our special coverage on Boston's tech scene with the president and director of the Museum of Science here in Boston, where we sit now. Dr. Yanis Miaulis joins us to discuss well, how this world-renowned cultural institution is inspiring the next batch of tech innovators and engineers. And a reminder that all episodes of Bloomberg Technology are now live streaming on Twitter. Check us out. It's at Bloomberg Tech TV, weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology, live from the Boston Museum of Science. A cornerstone in maintaining and growing a city's tech ecosystem is or passing the love of innovation and science along to the next generation. We are currently in a place that is aiming to do just that. Touted as the city's most visited cultural institution, the Boston Museum of Science offers programs and interactive exhibits that introduce its more than one and a half million annual visitors to science, technology, engineering and maths. Earlier, I spoke to Dr. Yanis Miaulis, Boston Museum of Science President and Director, and I started by asking about the age demographics coming through the door to visit the exhibitions. Our museum is designed for all ages. Of course, like every other science museum, the age range that uh, most of our visitors uh, fall are uh, children from uh, 5 to about 14 with uh, parents or, or uh, relatives or friends that come over along with, with school groups. But what's appealing to people of all ages is that we not only present science, uh, how the, the natural world works around us, but also we present engineering as an equal to science, how the human-made world uh, works and uh, how the two interact together. How is technology wrapped up in the way that science is consumed here at the Boston Museum of Science? Well, we present technology and science as the total world uh, that, and how the two coexist together. Uh, we have a fabulous new gallery, the Yorkie Gallery, which basically uh, presents how technology and science uh, coexist and how the natural world and the human-made world uh, have made this environment here on the Charles River uh, possible. And this is a perfect example of interaction of natural world and human-made world. Interaction with the rest of Boston, not only the river. Talk to us about how the ecosystem works with the Museum of Science and equally you feed back into it. Well, Boston is a fabulous city for science and technology and a great city to live in. Uh, we have uh, some of the best universities, some of the best hospitals, some of the top corporations, both in the high-tech area and the biotechnology area. And the museum offers a wonderful window uh, to the public. So we, we, we partner with a lot of companies, a lot of universities, to present the wonderful work they do in both research development and technology development. With those partnerships, does money flow? How, how have you found funding such an institution such as such as this? Uh, we have been very fortunate uh, to attract uh, funding both from federal uh, sources and, and local sources, corporations, foundations and of course philanthropy. Uh, we're the number one funded institution from the federal government, uh, our kind of institution, science museum uh, kind of institution. Uh, and uh, so money is very important for what we do, but uh, because of the kind of work that we do and the engagement uh, that we offer to funding uh, sources, we have been very fortunate. The willingness to give, how much is that also wrapped up with the willingness to see more diversity when it comes to science and education? Because there's a lot of concern that perhaps the reason we don't have ethnic minorities and as many females as we'd like to see in Silicon Valley and in some of the tech giants, no matter where they are in the world, is that STEM isn't really being edu educated the way it should be. Uh, we are, one of our top priorities is to present science and engineering in a way that is equally appealing to both uh, boys and girls and men and women and also to present science in a way that would be appealing in uh, groups that traditionally don't come to the science center. And we have been very fortunate in these areas. Just to give you an example, uh, one of my favorite exhibits is the design challenges area where children can spend, uh, they spend about half hour actually to design and build something and, and compete with each other. Uh, one would think, the stereotypical thinking would be that boys would be more interested in that than girls, but apparently we have more girls that are interested in this, the way we present this engineering activity than boys. And you're very much talking about a role in education. How do you see yourself fit? Because it's not just the more than a million that walk through your doors every single year, it's the 12 million that you're educating worldwide, and I really want to get your, your focus on where this goes globally. Uh, the museum uh, has acted as a wonderful platform to introduce engineering as a new discipline into children, children's lives from all over the world. Uh, we started this endeavor when I came here in 2003 and now have become the primary driver of engineering education for young children worldwide. Uh, we develop curriculum that's being used now by over 14 million children actually. We add 2 million children every year. Uh, we have uh, trained about 150,000 teachers and uh, now we operate internationally. How much bigger can that become? 
What's your What's your view? What's your outlook for the next 10 years? For... Uh, my dream is to have every child uh, anywhere in the world to understand both the natural world and the human-made world, and to have engineering become part of every kid's life. Not necessarily to become an engineer, but engineering offers a wonderful way to learn how to problem solve, which is a skill you can use on anything. And how optimistic are you in today's environment when we have concerns about the administration's dedication to the funding of biotechnology, of education? Is this something that worries you? Um, it's, it's of concern, of course. Uh, however, what I have seen through the years is if you do good work and you stick with it, then it, it's not a big issue. You can plow through it. That was Boston Museum of Science President and Director Yanis Mayerlis. Now, SoftBank is said to be close to completing its technology fund as early as next week, with commitments reaching $95 billion. That's according to people familiar with the matter. Companies like Apple and Qualcomm have previously said that they're investing money. The Japanese company announced plans for the Vision Fund last year. Now, coming up, gene editing is seen as the next big breakthrough in medicine, and there are three Massachusetts-based firms working on it. We'll bring you details on the companies using CRISPR. From Boston, this is Bloomberg. And welcome back to a special edition of Bloomberg Technology from Boston. Now, CRISPR is a new gene editing tool that could transform biotechnology. The technique edits DNA with unprecedented accuracy and it's hoped will play a big role in medicine. Bloomberg's Johnny Bloomfield spoke with the three public companies all located in Cambridge, Massachusetts that are racing to use CRISPR in real life and prove it can work to treat disease. The gene editing tool, CRISPR, is boosting crops, tweaking the genetics of mosquitoes, and creating Lyme disease-proof mice. Now companies are racing to use the technology in humans. CRISPR is, in my lifetime, probably the most exciting single invention that I've seen. Editas, Intelia, and CRISPR Therapeutics are the only public CRISPR companies in the U.S all with labs in a three-mile stretch of Cambridge, Massachusetts. CRISPR is a technology to accomplish what's called gene editing. And this is for patients with diseases that are caused by mistakes in the DNA, the ability to go to the level of DNA and repair the broken gene. The biotech companies, which all went public last year, aim to first test the technology in relatively simple genetic diseases, where a small genetic tweak can cause devastating damage. In essence, how this works is, it is, think of a GPS localization signal or a zip code, right? You put a zip code onto what we call a pair of molecular scissors. And the molecular scissors don't work until the zip code delivers the molecular scissors to the part of the region or the part of the genome that we're targeting it to. CRISPR Therapeutics and Editas want to start human trials by 2018. CRISPR is moving at a rapid pace. If you had asked me two or three years ago how long it's going to take to get to the clinic, we would have predicted a much longer time frame than what we're staring at now. CRISPR Therapeutics wants to start by genetically engineering the cells of people with rare blood disorders outside the body before putting them back in. And Editas aims to inject CRISPR tools into the eyes of people with a rare form of genetically caused blindness. Intellia's Birmingham sounds a more cautious note. His company hasn't given a timeline for when it will put products into people. Given the fact that we're going in and you're modifying your DNA, which we've not been doing with other therapeutic approaches, there are some considerations we need to be very thoughtful about. Scientists in China are moving faster. Researchers there started the first CRISPR human trial last year, and scientists have used CRISPR to modify the genomes of human embryos. Where do you draw the line? That it's a curative treatment or potentially curative treatment for a disease versus an enhancement to an individual. 
For now, the three leading CRISPR companies in the U.S. are focusing on tackling disease and are in a complex series of patent battles in the U.S. and Europe. Basically, the issue is about inventorship, right? So who actually invented this? With the academic groups behind Intellia and CRISPR on one side and Editas on the other. In February, Editas surged after the MIT and Harvard-backed Broad Institute fended off a challenge from UC Berkeley in the U.S., keeping both patent estates alive for now. Intellia and CRISPR fell in the news and are appealing the decision. It is too early to say which companies are going to be best at developing drugs at, at this stage of developing medicines. Ultimately, human trials in the next few years will tell us more about how this revolutionary technology will change our genes and our health. I think that the impact, frankly, we, we're only beginning to understand it. There are 6,000 genetically defined diseases, 95% of them have no approved medicines. So there's a very long list of patients who could potentially be helped with this kind of approach. That was Bloomberg's Donnie Bloomfield there. Fascinating stuff. Now coming up, we take a look at Boston's biotech scene even further with Bluebird Bio CEO Nick Leshley and discuss why the company chooses Boston as a place to develop its business. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio, why don't you? You can now listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the US on Sirius XM. This is Boston, and this is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. The White House is congratulating Moon Jae-in in his election as South Korea's new president. Press Secretary Sean Spicer said the administration is looking forward to working with Moon to strengthen the alliance between the two countries. President Trump and Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas just met last week at the White House. Well, now Abbas says the two will meet again in Bethlehem. Abbas says the president has accepted his invitation to join him in the West Bank City during his visit to Israel in two weeks. Senate Republicans are getting down to work on their version of the repeal of Obamacare. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says action is needed now because health markets are collapsing. Democrats sent a letter to McConnell asking him to drop repeal and replace legislation. French police are searching for three men suspected of plotting an Islamic State-inspired attack after authorities conducted a major operation at a Paris train station. The evacuation of the station came a day after the tense presidential election won by independent Emmanuel Macron, who has said one of his top priorities will be ensuring France's security. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti, and this is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Tuesday here in Washington, 7.30 Wednesday morning in Canberra, Australia. We are joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen. That is where he is with a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Elisa. Well, we're seeing some strength on the Nikkei futures uh, traded out of Chicago and Osaka. Not so for ASX futures, currently pointing down about two-thirds of 1%. Uh, this is after the broader ASX fell about half a percent yesterday, really dragged down by the banking stocks there. Take a look at Commonwealth Bank, for example, off almost 4%, and Commonwealth Bank makes up about 9% of the ASX by weight. So where that one goes, uh, the rest of the market follows. And we could be poised for more of the same today. And that's why I'm here in Canberra, because last night we had the Australian budget handed down and that contained a liability level levy on the big four banks aimed at raising $4.6 billion over the next four years. Uh, also in that budget we see a deficit of $21 billion US dollars. The Australian budget expected to return to surplus though by 2020, 2021. Other things to watch out for today, we have uh, China CPI and PPI for April and also South Korean unemployment figures. I'm Paul Allen here in Canberra. More from Bloomberg Technology next.
Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde, and we are live from Boston all this week, showcasing the innovation, the diversity, and the power of this city's tech economy. Now, one thing that Boston is known for is its booming biotech scene. One major player in the field it's Bluebird Bio. The company's platforms encompass gene therapy, cancer immunotherapy, and gene editing, and recently announced that healthcare company Novartis and pharmaceutical giant GlaxoSmithKline will pay undisclosed sums to license its technology for delivering genetic material into cells. Joining us now is none other than the CEO of Bluebird Bio, Nick Nashley. Nick, wonderful to have you here. Thank you In for a, It's trying to be sunny for us. A little chilly. Um, give us, therefore, First of all, how your gene therapy vis-a-vis -vis the competition, whether it's here in Boston or abroad, compares? So it compares. I mean, gene therapy is a broad space, right? But what it really compares on, what we try to compare on, is the data that we have and the impact it's having on patients. I mean, as a concept and the promise of gene therapy has always been, you can go in and you can fundamentally alter disease. You can potentially cure disease. And that's the big differentiator for some of the programs that we work on and some really terrible diseases where we've been able to, and now still small numbers of patients, but we're progressing, fundamentally go from not just kind of ameliorating or an incremental benefit, but potentially curing these patients meaning giving them a lifelong benefit. And that is converting the promise of gene therapy that I think all of us have perhaps been rooting for, certainly in the biotech space. That's what Bluebird's all about, and that's what we're trying to do. And a number of the, broadly speaking, gene therapy companies, whether it's gene editing, and there's a whole class of us that are trying to really do something important for patients. And doing it here in Boston and the greater Massachusetts, how important has the ecosystem been for you and some of your rivals or frenemies, as they might be? No, I think we're all trying to do the same thing. So we try to sort of think of it as co-opetition in that sense. <laughs> but Boston has been fabulous. Um, it's really developed into an ecosystem over the last, let's say, decade, where you have everything you need in the sense that it starts with academia and ideas, with research and the innovation that comes with it, that moves to the medical institution, the translational nature that that brings, and the talent that that brings along with it. And then you have the investors, so venture people who really start to seed and start companies, just like Bluebird, where I was originally at a place called Third Rock Ventures to help start uh, Bluebird, uh, sort of restart it, if you will. But then you also have investors, like public investors and others, that can help carry it to the next stage. And then you have biopharma and pharmaceuticals. All we heard earlier in your show, the R&D centers are here. So you kind of have everything you need, plus all the talent. And that's the key part. So the sweet spot may be a perfect storm. I want to dig into two of those areas you bring up, talent being one of them, the VC side of you being the other. Talent, how much at the moment is that an area of optimism for you, or is there any concern, particularly with the current administration clamping down potentially on immigration to a certain extent? I think that's an important uh, context. So talent to try to cure disease has to come from a global uh, pool. And so it's not all going to be in Boston. There's a tremendous number of people who come here to study and would love to stay here to continue their research or their ideas, whatever it may be. So that is incredibly important that wherever we land politically, that we have an ability that is an open sort of gate towards innovation. Uh, that's certainly something I personally feel strongly about and Bluebird in particular has benefited from. So our talent pool relies on that and that's something that we certainly um, are trying to actively support and encourage. And that I think still stays there and Boston in and of itself has been incredibly supportive. I'm not worried about the talent pool, but it changes. As we get bigger, some of the people that really loved working for Bluebird are thinking about, I want to go back and start the new thing. Yeah. Right? And that's okay. That creates a healthy turnover. And that's something we've seen from big pharma companies all the way down to two, three piece uh, person companies. So it's fun to be part of. And so perhaps people from your venture going off and spawning other new startups, what about your previous role as a VC? I'm interested in what about the ecosystem of money being built here in Massachusetts? Yeah. Is, is it starting to build? Does it need to? Are you just waiting for international money to flow in and indeed moving to the public markets? Yeah. I think it's been here for some time. Uh, it's been here a lot of uh, early on in the IT sector and the tech sector. And then biotech was here, was more on the medical device side. Now it's very heavy on the biotech side. But there's different types of money. There are some of the earlier stage companies like 5AM Ventures or Atlas or Polaris or Third Rocks. They really try to foster and initiate companies. Smaller dollars, still relatively big in my book, but smaller dollars. And then as they get bigger, you need the bigger investors. You need the fidelities of the world who are also here to really carry you to the next uh, step and that so it's here it's just a matter of selecting the right ideas and cultivating them and that's the ecosystem's been good at that you went public 
does it suit these long-term bets that biotech and that Bluebird Bio and its very nature does? How long-term are your investors when you are on a public market such as the Nasdaq? Yeah, well, as as I know, I'm sure you know the quote. You get the investors you deserve to some extent, right? And so, if each company cultivates itself having a long-term vision, I think you can select for investors that do have the long-term nature. It is a constant struggle as a CEO. One of the things I don't particularly love is there is a short-term horizon that you have to understand at least. You don't necessarily have to operate the company for that short term because you do have to take a position on where do you want to be three years, five years. And so that's certainly where Bluebird is, but you have to be cognizant of both. And that's a reasonable pressure, right? Because everyone has to contribute their part and you can't just say I'm worried about 10 years from now when you have a lot of investors that are important and have supported the company. You have to be cognizant of that and manage to that. So I think that's a, a natural tension um, that we all as CEOs have to certainly consider and respect quarterly joy. What about <laughs> three to five years, you said, you've got to be looking out to that time frame. Talk to us, therefore, about the deal that's been struck with Novartis, with Glaxo. How does your business continue to evolve as it works on some of these rare diseases and breakthrough technologies? Yeah. You know, that's an interesting one that actually dates back to some of the innovation we talked about and some of the early stage IP in the field, in our case of gene therapy, where we use a particular type of virus that now has become part of a lot of these car therapies or immunotherapies that you've seen that Novartis is working on. It's also part of other programs for some really important diseases that GSK is working on. And one of the things that we Bluebird certainly would not want to stand in the way of is allowing them to sort of take those forward to patients and to provide and to the providers to use them. So that was what the nature of that deal. It was an enabling deal. It was a way for us to participate uh, in and share in our intellectual property with them. And so that's a good thing. But really, we're focused on the main driver for Bluebird is trying to do what they're doing, which is to actually to create products that make a big difference for patients. And that's our emphasis. And that ultimately is what I think our shareholders are expecting from us and they should expect from us. And that's the standard we hold ourselves to. And certainly the patients are hoping for. Nick Leslie, yeah, you bet. Wonderful to have you with us. Thank you for um, putting on the puffer and sticking on <laughs> with us in this cold. Nick Leshley, of course, Thank Bluebird you. Bio CEO, joining us there. Now, Facebook, famously started by Mark Zuckerberg in a Harvard dorm room, is perhaps considered by Boston's tech community as well, the one that got away. Headquartered in Menlo Park, California, Facebook quietly returned to Cambridge in 2013, though, to open an engineering office. And today, more than ever, the company is taking advantage of the town's top talent. Kendall Square in Cambridge is the heart of Boston's tech community. And West Coast software giants have taken note, establishing a presence here. Facebook is always looking for an opportunity to hire the best talent. We came here because Boston is a combination of really talented senior engineers and a lot of great universities. Site lead Ryan Mack helped Facebook open its Boston office nine years after Mark Zuckerberg developed the social network at nearby Harvard. Since then, the office has grown to 18,500 square feet and employs about 100 engineers that tackle some of the company's toughest challenges. Most of what we're working on in Boston is infrastructure. About two-thirds of the office is working on the technology that is the underpinning for the products that other people who use Facebook see on a regular basis. Mac breaks it down into four pillars. Compilers, storage, security, and networking. These are the systems needed to develop the applications that reach Facebook's 1.8 billion users. The Cambridge team also supports some of the social network's most visible projects, like Facebook's live interactive comment stream. For example, when you post a comment on a video on Facebook, anyone else who's looking at that video will see that comment in real time and location-based products like Facebook's live video map and marketplace that helps users buy and sell things locally. The global company with a market cap of $425 billion, the world's fifth largest, has even more ambitious plans in its 10-year outlook. We can actually give more people a voice. And along with Facebook's engineering teams in its headquarters in Menlo Park, Seattle, London and New York, the Cambridge team will play its part, particularly in connectivity. How do we get connectivity to the next billion people? And we're doing that through building up foundational technologies that can work with a greater ecosystem outside of Facebook to make cellular and Wi-Fi technologies cheaper. Projects like Terragraph and TIP that are really trying to change the cost curve so that we can deliver fast networks to part of the world today that just don't have network availability at all. Social networking on a local and global scale. Coming up, Disney reports second quarter results. We'll hear from the CEO, Bob Iger, next. From Boston, this is Bloomberg.
Breaking news live here from Boston for you that James Comey has been removed from heading the FBI. This is a statement from Sean Spicer coming from the president saying President Donald J. Trump has informed the FBI director James Comey that he has been terminated and removed from the office. President Trump acted based on clear recommendations, he says, of both Deputy Attorney General and the Attorney General. The FBI, Trump says, is one of the nation's most cherished and respected institutions and today will mark a new beginning for our crown jewel of law law enforcement, so says President Trump. A search for the new permanent FBI director will begin immediately, so says the statement. Now, with that, we turn our attention to a different focus. Of course, it was earnings day for the media giant Disney, and it reported after the close. Profit in the quarter declined as its cable division continues to lose subscribers. Let's go now to my colleague David Weston in New York, who's standing by with Disney CEO Bob Iger. David. Thanks very much, Caroline. Yes, we do have Bob Iger, the chairman, the president, CEO of uh, Walt Disney Company. One of the less credentials he has is he was my boss for some time. So, Bob, welcome back to Bloomberg. Good to have you here. Thank you, David. So as we just said, you've got your earnings out. And what I took at least away from it is that you, you exceeded the expectations uh, with respect to profitability, earnings per share, exceeded by a good margin, fell a little short of what was expected on the revenues. We can talk about that, but let's start with where you really had the beat on the earnings. It looks to me like it's a story of the theme parks and the studios. Is that the story from where you sit? It is the story from where I sit for the quarter that uh, we just announced, yes. Uh, both of those units were up 20 percent, 21 percent. Parks and resorts up 20 percent, studio up 21 percent. Uh, the result of a continued uh, trend in the marketplace that is quite positive, certainly tourism, visitation to our parks, uh, not just in the U.S., but across the globe, and the fact that the product we have in the marketplace is working. And of course, on the studio front, is the result of years of smart investment, the acquisitions that we made of Marvel, Pixar, and Lucasfilm, certainly part of that, but also fantastic execution by a first-rate team across the board. Uh, on the theme park subject, how sensitive is your business to consumer spending? Because that's something we watch at Bloomberg pretty carefully, and there's been a little bit of softness in the last week or two. How sensitive is your business to that? Well, clearly a healthy consumer is, uh, is, is good for the Walt Disney Company's theme park business, but uh, the vacations and the experience that we offer are extremely unique. Uh, something that consumers, you know, covet. In some cases, they they save up for a long period of time, or it's part of a long-term uh, planning uh, on in their lives, whether it's for vacation or celebrating something else in their lives, and so they tend to sacrifice that less than sometimes other things. Uh, but we also rely on consumers, not just from the United States, but from across across the globe. And, and we also we rely on the intellectual property and the storytelling that we create as a company, too. And so there's a lot in those parks that leverages the great storytelling of the studio, for instance, and, and remains in demand even when times are a little bit more difficult economically. So uh, Shanghai is something that is near and dear to your heart. That was a big long-term project you worked on personally for a long time. Mm -hmm. I understand it's now profitable already. It's exceeding your expectations, you've said. I know you, I've seen you do this. You always expand something that's working. I know there are already some plans to expand Shanghai. Are you doubling down on that or are you thinking about additional parks in China? Well, first of all, yes, uh, this was a, a, a particularly important project for me. I worked on it for over 17 years, and I'm extremely proud of what our team ultimately designed and created. But I'm also very proud of uh, how it's been operated over the first year and proud of how the Chinese people have taken to it. So we're probably just a few days away from hitting 10 million in attendance. It had been our target to hit 10 million in attendance for the first year. We celebrate a first year anniversary in mid-June, so we're running ahead of where we ha actually had hoped we would be. About two-thirds of the attendance from outside is from outside the Shanghai area. That's very, very interesting because it suggests that this is a national destination, which frankly we didn't expect. I think we thought about this time that about two-thirds of the attendance would be from within the Shanghai region, and the opposite has been the case. So that's very, very encouraging. Uh, we have a piece of land that is very large in, in, in terms of not only the size, but the ability to build it out and a willing partner to enable us to do that. We announced expansion actually before we opened, and so we're building a large Toy Story land as we speak. We've not announced a specific date for it, but uh, it's already under construction. 
And we believe that given the success of this business already and, and given the size of the land and the interest of our partners to continue to invest in it, that you will see substantial expansion uh, of this particular facility uh, over the, you know, the next five to ten years. And uh, it, it, that, I think, is very, very encouraging. Uh, we've always believed that there are other opportunities in China, but our first priority has been to open this one and to do it right. And uh, since it's less than a year old, it would be premature for us to speculate about anything more that we might be doing in another market in China. But we certainly hope at some point that uh, that opportunity presents itself. So we have theme parks and studio, big upside. Let's talk about some of the things that some people at least feel disappointed about, and that's ESPN. Now, it's been almost two years ago now that you said this would be coming. Trees don't grow to the sky. There would be some tapering off in ESPN growth. Uh, that's happening now. You've also said on our program, actually, that the digital alternatives, the mobile experience, would replace that over time. Do you have a time horizon about when that will take place, when you'll be making enough of these alternative revenue sources to make up for what you're losing on the basic cable? No, well, you're, you're, you're right to point out that we were candid about this a few years ago. Frankly, I think more is being made of this than it deserves. ESPN is still a very, very healthy, very, very profitable business, one of our most profitable uh, businesses. It has a stable of live sports that it has licensed for a long period of time that is going to serve it extremely well, that is serving it well today on its traditional platform, that is starting to serve it well on new platforms, and that will serve it well for the foreseeable future. It is a product that is in demand. And the fact that there is still a lot of competition for live sports rights, I think, only points out uh, just how valuable this product is. And no one's got more of it uh, than ESPN. What's happening is exactly what we thought would happen, and that is that there is a, um, a decrease in the number of expanded basic subs on traditional platforms. That's happened for a few reasons. The expanded basic product is a relatively uh, more, well, certainly more expensive than some of the products that have launched on the new platforms and has more channels than many people believe they need. It still dominates, by the way, the business. More people are expanded basic subs than, and, and, than anything else. But it's definitely decreasing, and we're starting to see some share shift from that, the large uh, bundle, so should, we should call it, at a you know, price that is typically in excess of $100 to smaller bundles that are launching on mostly new platforms, over-the-top, digital-only platforms, in some cases platforms that are very mobile-friendly and very, very user-friendly. And that's attractive certainly to younger people, not just because of the cost, but because of the usability factor. And that bodes well for us. We're seeing some nice growth. But some of these platforms are brand new. YouTube just launched theirs a, a month ago, and Hulu just launched theirs this week. And so it's still too soon to say, uh, you know, when lines will cross or when that will, I'll say, pick up the slack that uh, has been created by some sub losses on the other side. But we're encouraged by the signs that we see. We believe we've got great product to offer. The distributors know that live sports is imperative for them to succeed in that space. And that's why they're negotiating deals that have ESPN on all of their subs. This is only the beginning, and it will continue. And frankly, we're feeling very optimistic about it. I think the reaction to it suggests otherwise. But that's not the case with us. And we've taken a number of steps to contend with exactly what we're seeing. This is not something that we're just getting to. It's something we've been working on for a few years. And I think it's high time that people start looking at ESPN in a very positive way and not a negative way. Think about how mobile devices are being used and what for, as a for instance. Uh, that live sports window or that, live, that player that has live sports on it is very valuable when you're sitting with a smartphone or, or a tablet or a laptop, whether you're in your office or in okay. a bus or uh, wherever. And, and I just think that um, uh, the, the pessimism about ESPN is, is highly exaggerated. Okay, Bob, thank you very much. I'm sorry we're running out of time. I've got a lot more questions, but I really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Back to you, Caroline. All right, David, thank you. Fascinating conversation. David Weston, thank you very much indeed with none other than Bob Iger, of course. Welcome back and a recap of the breaking news that James Comey has been removed as the head of the FBI, as comes from news from the White House. We understand that the attorney general gave this recommendation to Donald Trump. James Comey is no more at the FBI. Now that's it from Boston. Plenty more this week from Bloomberg Technology.